Okay, so what is enthalpy? Remember that we refer to enthalpy as delta H, where H is enthalpy. Enthalpy refers to the chemical energy of a chemical reaction. So we refer to it as the chemical energy. Okay, and uh, so the way that we calculate enthalpy is that we say that the change in enthalpy of a standard state reaction, remember that's the not, that's the not part. This is going to be the sum of all the enthalpies of formation, the change in enthalpy of formation of the products, minus the sum of the change in enthalpy of formation of the reactants. Okay, so that was one of the ways that we could calculate uh, enthalpy. We also talked about, and that was the direct method. The other way that we could calculate enthalpy is to use Hess's law, where if we know a process takes place in one step or three steps, it's going to be the same enthalpy. We could also calculate enthalpy by looking at the bond dissociation enthalpies. How much energy does it cost to break a bond versus how much does it cost to make a bond? Okay, so uh, primarily though, going forward for everything that we're going to talk about thermo this, this semester, we're looking at take, calculating the enthalpy directly from the enthalpies of formation. Now, another way to look at a chemical reaction is to talk about how spontaneous a chemical reaction is or not. Like, like for instance, if we see ice melting at zero degrees Celsius, is that a spontaneous process? So, meaning, is it going to, do we have to do anything to it in order to make that ice melt? Okay, so in that sense, do we have to do anything to make that ice melt? Well, what is, what is a spontaneous process? What does spontaneous mean in chemistry? Well, spontaneous for us means that it, a chemical process proceeds on its own without an, a continuous external influence. Okay, and so for this, I, for this example, I have skiing down here. Uh, but think of it this way. If you're skiing or you're going snowboarding or you're going sledding, the first thing you need to do is you're trying to build up. You're trying to push yourself down that hill. So that's the first thing. You got, those, you got your spokes. You put, it in, uh, you put it in the snow and you propel yourself forward. And if you do it with enough force... You only have to really propel yourself once to start moving downhill. Okay, so a spontaneous process. Yes, there was a little bit of cost and energy at the beginning to push you forward, but spontaneous means after that initial initial, initial nudge, you don't have to supply energy. You don't have to you don't have to supply heat or energy to make this process go. It goes on its own. Okay. Now, a non-spontaneous process takes place only in the presence of a continuous external influence. So think of it this way. You get to the bottom of the hill. Okay, you want to go again. What do you have to do? You got to go to the top of the hill. So there's only a couple ways. There's only two ways that you can go up. You can get on a chairlift, and it takes you from the bottom to the top. Or you have to walk up. And so it's going to be one of those two ways. Now, that being said... If it's one of those two ways, you're con constantly having to either expend that energy yourself or there's a machine that's going to help you move from one place to another. But that machine is going to be doing the work. It's constantly going to be doing the work. So that's the difference here between a spontaneous process and a non-spontaneous process. The, in a spontaneous process, you have to supply a little bit. A little bit of energy to get going but after you get going that's it you don't need anything else non-spontaneous you constantly have to keep supplying heat or energy to make the process happen okay so for skiing spontaneous process you're going downhill and for a non-spontaneous process you're going uphill all right, so if a reaction occurs spontaneously, then we say that the system has an increase in the amount of molecular randomness. 
And we actually call that amount of molecular randomness in a system, we call this entropy. Okay, and we represent entropy with the letter S. Again, entropy is the amount of molecular randomness in a system. All right, so the amount of molecular randomness in a system. Okay, so some of you may have seen this term before. You may have, in your Gen Chem 1 class, you may have talked about, you may have talked about entropy a little bit. Uh, some of you have not, so that, that's why I'm actually taking time to let, review it, so that way everyone's on the same page. So... If you haven't seen it before, not a problem. Keep keep watching. Keep 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 doing the notes. All right. So again, entropy is the amount of molecular randomness. So, how does a reaction re occur spontaneously or non-spontaneously? So the way that we calculate a change in entropy, we say that the change in entropy delta S is going to be equal to the final entropy value minus the initial entropy value okay and when randomness increases delta s is going to be a positive value and when the system is more ordered delta s is going to be a negative value now two factors that determine the spontaneity of a chemical or physical change depends on a release or absorption of heat, and that's your enthalpy value. And then you also have to, we also have to use the increase or decrease in molecular randomness or the entropy. So delta H and delta S helps us, we have to use those two to help us determine whether or not a reaction is going to be spontaneous. Okay, so to summarize, a spontaneous process means that delta H should be negative. So that means we're dealing with an exothermic process. And then delta S should be positive, which means it's going to be, the reaction is going to be more random. Okay. Now a non-spontaneous process, on the other hand, means you're going to have a positive delta H, so you're going to be endothermic. Okay. And then a negative delta H, which means you're going to be more ordered. Now, we're actually, just as an FYI, this is actually something we're going to be talking about near the end of the course. We're actually going to come back to this and talk a little bit more about this. But this is going to be enough for us to get going. All right, so now, if we, now that we know what delta H is and delta S is, we can actually talk about how enthalpy and entropy contributes to the overall spontaneity of a process. And we use the Gibbs free energy, delta G, to relate delta H and delta S along with the temperature of the system. And the way that we do that is that we've got this equation that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And delta G, if you want to think of it this way, delta G means what we're asking is how spontaneous is this process? All right, so delta G gives free energy. Delta H, that's our enth enthalpy. Delta S, that's our entropy. And then T, temperature. Okay, and the temperature has to be measured in Kelvin. All right, so now if delta G is less than zero, so if delta G is negative, then that tells us that the reaction is spontaneous. And if delta G is more than zero, it's greater than zero, so it's a positive value, the reaction is non-spontaneous. And if delta G is equal to zero, then that means that the reaction is at equilibrium. Okay.
So let's try a problem out that puts all this stuff together. All right, so is the hopper process for the industrial synthesis of ammonia spontaneous or non-spontaneous under standard conditions at 25 degrees Celsius? At what temperature in degrees Celsius does this changeover occur? Okay, so you got this reaction, N2 plus 3H2 yields 2NH3. Delta H is equal to negative 92.2 kilojoules. Delta S is equal to negative 199 joules per K. All right, so before we do anything else, the entropy is reported as joules per Kelvin. The enthalpy is reported as kilojoules. So first thing we need to do is convert the entropy from joules to kilojoules. So let's do that. So you got negative 199 joules per Kelvin. And so we need to convert that joules to kilojoules. So there's going to be 1,000 joules in a kilojoule. So that way the joules cancel out. So negative 199 divided by 1,000, that should give us a value of negative 0 0.199 kilojoules per Kelvin. So we got a new delta S. So for part A, what this is asking, is the Haber process spontaneous or not? We have to solve for delta G. So we got our equation delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Okay. And this is all at standard state. So delta H, that value is negative 92.2 kilojoules. Okay. Minus... The T, the temperature, was 25 degrees Celsius. So if we convert that to Kelvin, that's 298 Kelvin. And we multiply that by our entropy, negative 0 0.199 kilojoules per Kelvin. All right, so the Kelvins cancel out. We're left with kilojoules. So if you take uh, 298 times negative 0.199, that gives you a negative 59.302 kilojoules. So if we take negative 92.2 kilojoules and subtract a negative uh, 59.302, that should give you, that's like adding, so that would give you negative 32.90 kilojoules. Now, according to what we talked about, if delta G is negative, then we know that this reaction is spontaneous. So this value tells us that this reaction is spontaneous. Okay, now the next part. Next part says this, what temperature does this changeover occur? So in other words, we want to know when does delta G equal zero? Because once delta G is equal to zero, if we know at what temperature it's at equilibrium, we just have to go one degree higher and we're at non-spontaneous. So we're going to say that delta H minus T delta S, this is equal to zero. And we're going to solve for T. So I'm going to subtract delta H from both sides. So I get negative T delta S is equal to negative delta H. Okay. If I divide by uh, divide both sides by negative delta S, okay, so that way the negative signs cancel out, the, uh, the delta S's cancel out, boom. So we've got T is equal to delta H divided by delta S. All right, so if we got those values, delta H, we know from our problem was 92.2 kilojoules. Delta S was 0.199 kilojoules. I'm dropping the negative signs because the negative si if we put the negative signs, we're going to multiply it by negative 1 to get a positive. So negative 92.2 divided by ne uh, 0.199 kilojoules, that will give us 463 Kelvin. And so that means if we, and so this is telling us that at 463 Kelvin, we're at equilibrium. 
and that means at 464 degrees Kelvin, or if we convert this back to Celsius, it's 191 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, this process is non-spontaneous. And there it is. So now we know enough, enough thermodynamics that we can now talk about making a solution and refer it back to thermodynamics. We can allow, let the thermodynamics tell this story.